Yes, it works. Good morning, if it's still morning. Uh, my name is Johannes Solilund. I'm uh, Director General for International Development Corporation in the, in the Foreign Ministry. And I have uh, the honor to be uh, moderating this panel. Uh, it's great that we have a, a full house. And uh, uh, my mom is a reverend. So, so I would go to church with her uh, on Sundays. And Sundays, uh, churches in Sweden are not very full. Uh, we have to admit that. And she would always start by saying, move up until the front row. And I'll, be, I'll soon be calling the panelists to come and sit up here with, with us. So then you can, you know, you in the back can move up and sit in the front and, and, and uh, be in that sense part, even more part of the congregation. Because uh, it is a fuller house than, uh, than the standard Swedish church on Sunday. So again, very wor warmly welcome here. Um, our ambition now is to try and push this morning's talk a little bit further. Uh, I've been instructed by colleagues to, uh, to be blunt and, uh, and pushy, and uh, we'll see if, if I do, if I, if I have to. Uh, but I, I will also give the same opportunity to you, to the, to the panelists, of course, but also to the... To the to the audience and to everyone here. We will, uh, what we're going to talk about is, is the, the possibilities and challenges in, in financing. Uh, we, we, we are talking about how to align incentives between stakeholders and uh, uh, to achieve that sort of common purpose that we have discussed this morning on, on how to address violent conflict. Uh, I think we have, in many ways, ad addressed the, the issues of commonality. So if we could take it a little bit further and see how we can use the instruments that we have at our disposal, both how we can improve the use of the instruments to, to basically rally more, more money for prevention, but also how we can use these instruments more efficiently to, uh, to achieve that alignment and to, well, break down the silos is, is, uh, is, is, is sort of a phrase that keeps coming back, but there are also other aspects to this of how we really align ourselves in what we do, both as, as donors and receivers, drivers of development in country, but also other actors as the, the private sector, civil society, and so on. So that's what we will be, be talking about. But I, I'm, I'm but the moderator, so I'm, I'll call uh, the panelists to, uh, to, to take a seat with us um, and also give me the opportunity to sit down, uh, which is good. Um, so first of all, uh, our Somali minister, uh, Abdi Mohamed Sabri. If you, no, am I, I'm wrong. I, I didn't start off well, did it? <laughs> and now I'm falling off the stage. Okay, that opens up for, uh, for more informality, I think so. S apologies, Minister. Please come to the stage. <laughs> and the Deputy Minister from Afghanistan, Adela Ras, and I think I'm right. <laughs> I'm approving, and then uh, I now I know I will be right, because Mike and the French and, and me have been in contact over mail for the past month or so intensively, and now had the chance to actually meet as well, so very welcome. <laughs> and Karin Yamtin, uh, Director General from SIDA, and we also know each other very well. <laughs> and Alexander Mark from the World Bank. Uh, <laughs> it's a twist between yes. bilaterals and the U.S. This is a north-south yes. okay. divide. Come, come, yeah. no, no, not don't do that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to listen to you yes, at the last thank presentation. You. Thank you. I was <laughs> like, don't put us again in well, one side. The World Bank <laughs> is bridging the divide. Yes. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Fantastic. Uh, so what we'll do is that I'll <coughs> set off the panelists by asking a few, a few questions. Uh, to give room for, for 
remarks, introductory remarks from, from each of you. Uh, and then we will follow up together as a group. I'll, I'll, uh, I it's might use my, my own sort of, uh, my holding the mic, but we'll also give an opportunity to, to the audience and also to other members to, to follow up with questions and try and really uh, deepen and, and drive this discussion. So if I may, uh, we, have, we have about an hour and five, ten minutes. Uh, so a good chance. No, please. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for helping me with that. It was a dangerous table anyway. I fell off the <laughs> stage. <laughs> <laughs> no good. I hope so. Good. Uh, Minister, if I may. Um, thank you very much. Um, we we have we've heard uh, this morning, and we 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 know um, uh, how how broad the engagement in Somalia is in terms of of international partners, uh, UN donors, World Bank, uh, traditional so traditional donors, but also new and emerging <coughs> donors, uh, including Gulf and and Turkey and so on. So my my first question would be if you could. Uh, share your experiences and tell us a, a little bit about how you keep how you keep this diverse group uh, moving forward together and uh, aligning with your uh, vision and, and 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 plans and 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 perhaps in that context also how uh, how you can can drive them in in becoming better donors or, or aligning better in 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 support of prevention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, the panelists and uh, the audience all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, first of all, I uh, thank international donors uh, who has uh, participated in uh, rebuilding Somalia uh, and also uh, giving assistance uh, either be assistance for humanitarian or institutional building or uh, peacekeeping. I think uh, uh, too many lives has been lost uh, from uh, some of uh, troop contributing countries uh, in order to make Somalia safer and better and we thank their contribution and effort. I think I talk, we talked earlier in the morning, um, international partners when they are coming to Somalia, I think they need to concentrate local need first and also coordinate with the government uh, as we are heading to establish a state institution, also stabilizing the country and peace building. Our relationship between international partners and ourselves are governed by mutual interest and mutual respect. So we welcome for the internationals to invest to build the country so that we can have uh, more job uh, creation, uh, better in institutional building. Um, our diplomatic relation is governed by uh, the Vienna Convention on diplomatic relations. So diplomacy is there and we will coordinate through diplomatic relation and uh, also uh, agreement we reach with them. And I think uh, if I shorten my answer is uh, our mutual uh, interest and our mutual respect is a governing guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Haji. Uh, if, I, if I turn to you, uh, Deputy Minister Ras, uh, I, I 
perhaps a, a somewhat similar question on on how how uh, how your government uh, your role in coordinating the the international support uh, and 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 how you can drive your priorities in in pro proactive prevention. Uh. Oh. Well, um, first of all, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to turn very repetitive today because apparently I'm in three panels. This is the <laughs> second one, so that's that's the first one. But in very my popular. benefit, repeating is better because you're going to remember exactly what I wanted to mm. convey <laughs> <in> <laughs> during the day. So, um, starting on uh, doing the coordination part with our international community and international donors. Um, actually, to be really honest, we haven't been successful uh, making that coordination happen. Um, and this uh, coordination aspect of uh, the government taking an, 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 an active role to reach out to the international community and, and require uh, such a coordination to happen it was uh, during last three years. We started to request uh, all the donor community, including the, interna uh, the uh, United Nations. So I think the first request we started to put for the United Nations was one UN. We still have not been successful to really come up with that, uh, working with them very closely to come up with the framework of the one UN in Afghanistan. So all the, the, the work that the United Nations is doing is coordinated with themselves. Because what we realized, and uh, there was a discussion earlier today, there, there were repetitive programs, uh, there was a lot of l um, um, uh, excessive use of resources, uh, not uh, targeted towards the needs of the government. And, and sometimes I think what happened, and I think I, I'm going to not be too critical towards the international community because in Afghanistan it is an active, uh, active insecurity incident uh, and it does make sense in a lot of uh, developing countries that when insecurity goes up, our restriction for international communities, their movement goes up too. So what happened in the last, let's say, five, six years, a lot of the international community started to be blocked in, in specific green zone. Mm -hmm. And then what happened being in that one area of the city in Kabul, they, they lost the uh, contact with the realities outside of the green zone. And uh, some of the, the United Nations agencies, the, 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 their vision or their priorities w were really linked to Afghanistan five, seven years ago. So, um, so w w we asked them to, to, to work together and put that one UN approach. Uh, in terms of other um, international institutions, we still have not done much. Uh, work and we haven't been successful, but one thing, we're moving in the right direction, meaning that first the government of Afghanistan have started to have a very broad uh, development approach. As I mentioned earlier, we ha do have a specific vision under the ANPDF, the Afghanistan National Development and Peace Framework. We have identified our priorities and uh, we uh, luckily we had two donor conferences. One was the London conference in 2000. And uh, end of 2014, I believe, right? Okay, and then we had the Brussels conference and now we're having the Geneva conferences. So all these uh, big engagements helped the government and the international community to sit together, together in one room for the first time and really critically think through what is really needed and what is not needed. And, and I think we were very blank, the government was very blank to say, we don't need this one, so it's okay, pull it out from the agenda. And, and I think that helped a lot. And, and also that clear engagement with the international community in areas that we lacked and we had trouble and we do have trouble, that's, that's uh, the reality. And there was a clear uh, discussion to tell us, you government is not doing a good job in here, so we have concerns e either handed over or we have to strengthen it up. So that, that helped. But the part which is the prevention, uh, pre prevention of conflict, I think because I, I really talked about the role of the international community, and I do want to say that the, we, the government also has a role in, in, in preventing conflict and really uh, the division of resources, uh, distribution of resources, the distribution of um, 
empower uh, political engagement, reaching out to our uh, civil society, to our local. I think we, we have been doing that uh, much more in the last three years compared to the past. And I think one reason is because, as I said, Afghanistan has moved in the last 15 years through a very interesting transition. We do have a very uh, dynamic uh, civil society, and I think it helped uh, the government accountable in a lot of areas. Uh, for the first time, we, we have started to acknowledge politically that we do have a corruption issue. And, uh, and I think for any change in any uh, developing country or, or, or any society, if we want to see, the first thing is to acknowledge that there is an issue and the second to address. And I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an important uh, aspect. Uh, the second is also uh, acknowledging uh, where we have lacked behind. We, we, we say it very openly that uh, in the last 15 years we have not engaged the two majority, but being the minority within the institution, meaning the woman and the younger generation. And uh, we have started to reach out to make sure we have a more of a younger generation. And today in, in the cabinet above, around 40% of the cabinet are uh, below the age of 40. And then, as well as women, women, I acknowledge, we all acknowledge women in the government and civil society in Afghanistan that uh, the woman representation is extremely weak uh, within the government. But it has still been approved, even in the last two years. And I'm just going to make an example. Uh, when I first joined uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a deputy foreign minister, I, th my first week I chaired a human rights dialogue with the EU. And I remember when I was chairing, and my right hand was the government official, and the left was the international community numbering the woman versus uh, the woman at the government side versus the international community obviously we were a small representation and i'm just going to request everyone to look at the recent which just happened uh, a day before uh, me coming here uh, another uh, type of dialogue that we had the same dialogue with the uh, eu and i was really proud to see that there was a larger number of women on the right side versus the left so that change is happening but it is slow and and the slow is not because there's no political commitment but i think the uh, it's slow because uh, we're still working with women to make sure A, they are encouraged to join the government, B, there is a safe environment or friendly environment for them to work, and third, uh, they have the right capacity and skill set. So I think I'm, I went beyond, but um, that's where the starting points are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think w there are a lot of very interesting points that we will come back to, but I, at first I'll, I'll invite you, uh, Karin, for uh, Sida has a powerful tools at its disposal to, to try and bring in private investment and so on. Uh, so I would just uh, want to raise that, uh, which is also an area that we touched upon very, very strongly this morning on, 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 on bringing private investment. So I would raise both the issue of, of, of the tools and, and the, your experiences um, from working with that, but also how that can be uh, specifically targeted to I mean the areas of conflict areas, which is always more challenging, or experience tells us is even more challenging than, than in other areas. And also perhaps uh, in, in line with that on, uh, you know, the possibilities to, to encourage sort of alignment with national plans in, in ter when, when engaging private ca uh, capital. Thank you, uh, Johannes. Is this on? Yes, it is. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it thank it you. Uh, thank you, Johannes, and thank you for, for an interesting question, challenging, of course. Um, CEDA works in different ways, but I would like to start off with reminding us all that the Sustainable Development Goals in Agenda 2030 actu actually obliges us to find new sources of, of financing to reach the goals, uh, in no matter if it's development, if it's prevention, if it's humanitarian. We have to work in different ways to finding different kinds of finance uh, and different ways of, of financing the, the work towards these goals. Um, we are, um, Sweden, uh, CEDA is a, uh, the biggest, I was going to say the Swedish Development Authority, but we are the biggest, <laughs> anyway, development agency in Sweden. And we work, of course, in all these fields, in humanitarian, in development, but also a little bit in the prevention field in different ways. We are guided by different uh, our instructions, etc. And in this, we have five perspectives. 
two overarching, rights perspective and the poor people's pers perspective, and then three perspective, the environment pers pers perspective, <laughs> uh, gender and conflict perspective. This means that we always have to, and we always try to, if we work with the private sector, with governments, with civil society, no matter what, we're trying to apply, uh, to put on this, uh, the conflict glasses, so to say, the a conflict perspective, to avoid doing harm, and hopefully to actually cause uh, less conflict uh, or stop conflict in different ways. I wanted to start there because it's I for us it's important to always try to streamline conflict prevention into all kinds of works, as this is one of the five perspectives that is guiding us. One important area, we, we are trying to work in, in I'm trying to say in two different ways. The one is an innovative, new think thinking in new ways. The other is, uh, one is quite a traditional way of working with development via civil society, governments, etc., in the more sort of stable areas. In uh, when it comes to the innovative way, we are working with tying the Swedish, um, Swedish big companies, the private sector, closer. We are in the this moment now uh, support or, or in the process of planning for a tax conference at the end of this month in Stockholm on uh, domestic resource mobilization mm. in our partner countries, mm. being it countries in conflict or just out of conflict or more stable countries. But domestic resource mobilization is important and tax is one way of doing that. In many ways we are working with funding and financing. My predecessor put in place a uh, two rather networks with the, bi the big Swedish companies. The one is called the Swedish Investors for su uh, Sustainable Development, the other one Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development. The first one obviously is uh, a network of investors, uh, the big pension funds and Swedish investors of different kinds. The other ones of the big Swedish companies, IKEA, Ericsson, uh, and others le we less well known for the public or uh, the international audience. But anyway, those networks are important places to discuss how we can uh, help de-risking investments in different, uh, uh, more troubled areas. The networks also has others, uh, other purposes, of course, but in this discussion here, that would be the most important part of these networks. If we can use the, our guarantee instrument in one way or other, if we can link them to some other partner or some knowledge somewhere, our next dis discussion in one of these networks at least will be on how to combat and see corruption, mm -hmm. as was mm -hmm. mentioned by the minister before, the deputy minister before, how we can help in combating corruption in all kinds of different um, uh, countries around the world and situations to help them actually invest because they want to invest uh, also in what can be uh, seen as more uh, problematic um, parts of the world. So we work in different ways. We have our guarantee instrument, which is a, a big instrument in when looking at uh, comparing it to other bilateral donors. And we are working closely with the, the, the private sector in different ways to try to mobilize more resources. But we are also, I'm being long here, I know, sorry Johannes, but I, will, I would like to say one more thing. It was mentioned by the minister from, from Liberia up in the morni this morning's panel that investment is needed for jobs and that jobs and a stable economic uh, development is a precondition for actually avoiding falling into conflict, but also hindering the conflict to continue. And we are working in lo a lot in this area of uh, private sector development, uh, job creation, uh, in different ways, both by um, supporting the rule of law, education, but also in concrete ways, supporting small businesses in different parts of the world. So there are many things that one can do, but also with this, al always with the sustainable goals and the goal 17, mainly, in, in, in remembering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, there are many things that we will come back to, I think. I, I, I turn to the, the divide bridger, or, or <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Mark, on 
I mean, you have personally been very involved, and, and your institution, the World Bank, uh, not least, I mean, in, uh, in the Pathways Report, and, and uh, leading the work to, to a large extent on uh, in this area. And uh, the idea, of course, is to, to uh, uh, shift focus to, to come in earlier and, and uh, invest before, uh, before conflict or to prevent uh, the eruption or re-eruption of conflict. And uh, so my question would be on, uh, uh, on incentives and how, y how you see this work uh, you know, turning <coughs> into concrete, uh, concretely turning into in incentives to, to work more uh, in your institutions, but I, I think it may be in, in the World Bank, but I think I could broaden it because you are leading in a way the international community uh, together with the UN on, on how to change this uh, perspective and how sort of... So well, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, in one of the main recommendations of the Pathway for Peace is not to stop to some big, nice statement, but to go down to what are the incentives that will allow the different actors to actually, in the way we described in the in the the report and that was discussed today very eloquently but uh, by by the people by the, the the authorities who were who were op opening the, the the session now the problem is that i think our society what it suffers the most for is a, is a of is a, is a global add uh, is a attention deficit <laughs> disorder <laughs> so oh, that right. that is a big problem in kin kindergarten uh, it's a big problem with children in kindergarten. It's a big problem uh, uh, in with elderly people. It's a huge problem with mid-sized uh, carrier people like me who are working for large uh, institutions. Mm. So, and I'm only saying that half-jokingly. <coughs> uh, we wanted in the Pathway for Peace to introduce the, uh, a box on the Tetris. You know, these games that you completely get in mm -hmm. where you have to be always quicker than what the machine is, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as a, as an example of what leads us outside of prevention. And I think that's the big challenge of our time, mm -hmm. right? We are bombarded with so much information that at the end, the person who wants to think, who wants to take time, who wants to uh, really think mm -hmm. carefully about what to do is the person who's not rewarded anymore in our institution in going further. And I'm very serious when I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that we are now, in the way structures are organized, flatter and flatter structures. At least it's a bit different in bilateral, mm -hmm. but the World Bank is becoming a very flat structure. Mm -hmm. So, a and the UN, there's a push, mm -hmm. it's not a flat structure, is the least we can say, but <laughs> it, it, mm -hmm. it is actually also pushed very much to become more flat because it needs to be able to make a lot of decisions in the field re very rapidly. You need to be able not to have to consult with too many people to be effective. And that has a lot of advantage, but it also means that when your leader says something, it's not going to be implemented automatically. Mm -hmm. And we know it very, very well because at the end, the staff who are relatively empowered are going to see where's the bottom line. Where are they going to mm -hmm. be recognized? And for an organization like the World Bank that is totally stretched at the, the maximum, like all development banks today, being between being a bank and trying to sustain their funding and being a public organization that take on things like climate change, like gender, gender parity, like uh, uh, you know, uh, fragility and conflict, which are our main pillar, it's, it's really a stretch because those things cannot be projectized. And as a bank, you want to projectize everything. And, and when you talk about uh, uh, peace, when you look at all what we have to do to work with the UN, with others, a lot of things cannot just fit into a project. So we have this, this huge stretch that we need to understand what are the incentives. At the end, the number one incentive of the staff is to make sure they disperse money and they avoid major reputational risk in doing it. Then the other things come second, you know, how do I deal with prevention, how do I deal with the sector? The first thing is I want to get my money through, do things that are sectorally good, and, and avoid a big reputational risks. And that will take already 95% of my time. What do I do with the 5% that are left? Mm -hmm. This is exactly the type of problem we have to bring prevention into the World Bank uh, uh, work. Yeah. Now, what we have decided to do that in terms of the management of the bank, 
is to do a, fr uh, a first thing, is to say, okay, money is very important for the bank, for a country director is really important. And so for the first time, we have four countries that are under what we call the risk mitigation facility. This is not small amount. It's one third more of the allocation, the country allocation of country for IDA coming to a country to do prevention work. So it's $300 million in three years in, in Niger. We're going to have more money there than all the money that is going to prevention uh, so far from all the other donors, right? But this is a bit of a scary thought because how are you going to turn around the incentive for people who are going to manage this money in doing things when the budget, the, the sort of day budget to do work is actually not changed at all? So that's what we're doing, but it's already a first step. So we have Tajikistan, Nepal, Niger, Guinea to start with, and we want to have an IBRD country to try to do something similar. Probably Tunisia will be on. We're already working with your team, uh, with the team of Marc-Andre on, on that. So we're, we're moving that. The second thing is we cannot work on every country in that way. We need to identify a couple of countries. We did it for... Uh, for uh, this, for, for with a formula that, that, that you know we can discuss, but I don't think it's the place to discuss it. But uh, uh, that obviously is not the best. You would realize by the countries that maybe it's not the one we have all on our radar screen. So we need a clear identification of what are the country at risk, and we need to do it with the UN and some others. And now we're working with a system that can say every three months, these are the country we have, and then have a clear protocol about how you approach those countries. This goes totally against this idea that you leave a lot of room for the directors to decide how they do their program and all that. But it's the only way we're going to be able to change the incentive system. So we're going to try with that. The third thing is to have, finally, an open and clear dialogue. And that's what G7 Plus is always saying on the hard things. So we had, hit, we had it on uh, corruption, we had it on a number of things. On fragility and violence is still something extremely difficult. Mm. And for the reason that, that a lot of countries see as an in infringement on sovereignty. A and we know that, and there was a very good discussion, and uh, your colleague from Liberia was mentioning that, you know, we have to think about what it is. Yes, sovereignty is strong, and the country needs to be absolutely in the leading role, but then we need to be able, if we're putting money, to talk also about those hard issues. So this is about trying to now put those uh, resilience and uh, uh, assessment, do them with other donors, and put them on the agenda very early on, and have a frank discussion about it. And, uh, you know, in Tunisia, when we start, we had that done, and we discussed it with the government, and we had the Agence Française de Développement, and now we want to bring the, the UN on. In Libya, we have a, a RA where we're doing with the uh, European Union, with the, with the UN, and trying to discuss it with the government. I, of course, it's not about the pure politics, the, the politics of the country, but it's all the development. As we know, the division between politics and, and development is very artificial. The fifth thing we're trying to do is to add funding, because we know that with the pure funding of the World Bank, we are not going to be the, the, the I'm, I'm saying the, the funding to do operation, the, no, our internal funding. And because we are a bank and we have AAA, the, the ratio between what we land and, and where is our uh, funding is extremely controlled. So we're very different than the bilateral, right? Mm -hmm. And there's very strong tight control about we cannot fund our staff by the money we, we, we land, right? So we have those constraints that are immense in the bank. We're going to try to get a, a fund that we have, it's called the State and Peace Building Fund, mm -hmm. to provide those countries that move into prevention, those much more flexible mm -hmm. funds, so we can do with the government all the things that are very difficult to do outside of a project. Have conferences, do joint mission with the UN, do all those things that you know a country director will never accept to fund because he said, I need my money to just get the money out and control the quality of disbursement and work on whatever <coughs> sectoral dialogue you need to have around the issue. Finally, we need to work on much better mechanism to work with the UN, mm -hmm. and we're working on it. It's still, very c it's still relatively complicated. We still have, uh, you know, uh, uh, a mis misunderstanding about how we work together. 
uh, you know, we, we still are, uh, and I can say that I think and because the reform of the UN is trying to correct that, we still have so many interlocutors. When you say the UN, you have to talk like to 40 people, 20 people, mm -hmm. depending. It's become absolutely impossible for us to do that as an organization that usually have one or two international staff when the UN have like 20 or 30 in the field, right? It's just impossible. So we need to work on all that. The RPBA, this, this recovery and peace building assessment, is one way we want to go and reinforce is a mechanism by which the EU, the UN, and the World Bank come and do <laughs> joint programming with the government around specific issues. We want to, to pull it much more for prevention. So we also want to reward staff who work in those countries. The reward staff who work with you on hard condition, that don't have their family with them and all that, and give them a much better chance to uh, promote to be promoted in the bank. Uh, and it's not a question of poor country, middle income country. Uh, you know, I'm not going, as a European, I'm not going <laughs> to go uh, into the discussion about the risk of conflict we have in our own <laughs> area or the, thing, the, the, the risk of very high tension. It's a question that you have for historical purposes and others. Some countries, actually today, there's more middle income countries that enter in conflict mm -hmm. than poor income exactly. countries. So it has nothing to do with the fragility mm -hmm. and the Obviously poverty. It, it is something more complex complex around social cohesion and other things. And we need to be able to uh, work and reward the staff to accept to work in those areas and who sees it as, as really their, their first thing. So sorry, I was a bit long, but that's the direction of our tra well strategy to get better funding. Yeah. Thank you for very uh, transparent and frank remarks on, on, on your internal processes, but also directed to, I think, all of us. And thank you very yeah. much for that. And now uh, I'll turn to, to another institution that has uh, Sort of championed uh, countering global ADD, as you as you <laughs> say, <laughs> is uh, in the in the center of, uh, mm. of an international debate. I mean, your 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 boss, uh, Secretary General, but and you also who who um, who work with the PBF and uh, the Peace Building Fund, uh, and so I would be very interested to hear on how you uh, how you see the same sort of field, the incentives that you can drive, but perhaps also uh, relating to Alexander's remarks on how you. So we can tie together this work with the pathways. And Fantastic. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Johannes, and it's really a pleasure for me to to be here among other ADD sufferers <laughs> and <laughs> friends and partners, and a real honor to be uh, sharing this this uh, session with all of you. Um, I mean, just before talking about the PBF, just to to remind uh, us all a bit about the the overall ecosystem of financing for peace building. I think it's it's important to set the context. Uh, just and, and I don't want to get into too much numbers, but just give a, a few a few hints. I mean, first, um, of course, ODA is is certainly not enough, and we need other instruments, particularly private funding, to to kick in. But the truth is that ODA, together with remittances, remains by far the the main source of funding for countries uh, and situations affected by by conflict. And ODA has increased in the last ten years particularly because of humanitarian aid, mm -hmm. but ODA for peace building mm -hmm. has remained stable at about only 16% of the total ODA mm -hmm. for conflict-affected countries. And that funding is extremely volatile from one year to another. So countries mm -hmm. such as uh, Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, have no idea how much money they'll get the year after. But also, uh, there's enormous inequalities. In the last 10 years, the lion's share of funding for peace building in conflict-affected countries has gone to two countries, Iraq and Afghanistan, leaving behind a lot of uh, countries and situations, a lot of those so-called aid orphans. And uh, national resources, as you were mentioning, are extremely low. Uh, only 4% of national resources are today uh, devoted to peace building by national governments and authorities. So extremely small. Um, and at the same time, funding for peace building activities at the United Nations uh, remains really siloed yeah, between the different pillars, uh, earmarked. Yeah? Uh, and we have a multiplicity of instruments uh, in every uh, in every one of the, s the the pillars and across the spectrum of before, during, and after violent conflict, 
At the same time, the good news, I think, is that this business of peace building is no longer a business of, of the North. Yeah? It's uh, increasingly the business of many other actors, African Development Bank, regional banks, but also the Gulf states. You mentioned Johannes Turkey um, and China. Uh, is, is also uh, an increasing player in Afghanistan, and, and, uh, and the minister could, could speak <coughs> about that. Uh, and the good news is that we have a lot of new instruments. In the last 10 years, of course, IDA, Alexandre, you, IDA is a big player now, but also the IMF, uh, uh, Rapid Credit Facility, the Instrument of Stability in the EU, and these instruments more than ever need to work together. So it's in this context that the Secretary General has called upon member states to have a, a quantum leap of support to the PBF. And the target is 500 million a year to respond to the, the, the minimum demand out there for support for, for peace building. And this can only be achieved through multiple sources. Uh, of course, increase in voluntary contributions, but also assess contributions. And there's all sorts of different assess uh, I have a lot of hope in the balance of peacekeeping and mm. some, some other uh, forms of assess, but, uh, and as well innovative finance, but only those options coming together will allow us, we think, to, uh, to achieve this target. Then you've asked, Johannes, uh, how can we as the PBF increase the amount of funding for peace building? Because at the end of the day, uh, 500 million is actually very little. Just to give you an idea, mm -hmm. it's maybe 75% of the cost of US, UK, and France operation uh, with the 85 tomahawks that they sent on Syria a few weeks ago. So we're talking about very little money at the end. Uh, and the way we can contribute to increase funding for peace building is by being catalytic. And catalytic in three ways. Uh, first, by filling critical gaps, uh, and that means focusing on aid orphans and designing and funding projects that attract funding from other sources, from domestic resources. That means focusing on investing in government systems, as we did in Somalia, investing in the legitimacy of state institutions and in service delivery. Uh, funding from other multilaterals and bilaterals by testing new approaches, by taking risks, and by sharing risk among donors. And finally, by the private sector, mm -hmm. either directly, as we've received now in Liberia, or by reducing risk for private sector to invest, as we did in Colombia. Our goal here is that for every dollar that the PBF invests, we can mobilize $10 from other sources for peace building in the country. The second way that the PBF is catalytic is by funding initiatives that either kickstart longer term peace building or that accelerate uh, blocked, uh, blocked efforts. Uh, and this we're, we're able to do by responding quickly, as, as we did recently in the G5 Sahel. In one week, we had a project going on to develop the human rights framework for the new G5 Sahel force by funding the development system, the development system to work jointly with the political leadership, with the security, humanitarian, and human rights pillars. And finally, by investing, and, and Alexandre mentioned it, and because this is at the heart of, of the Joint World Bank UN report, by investing in political inclusion, particularly of women and youth leaders, and, uh, and the report does a, a wonderful job in, in demonstrating why this is so critical. And third way that we, can be criti that we can be catalytic is by applying certain principles of engagement. And I just want to mention two now. Um, First, uh, really having this frank conversation, as Alexandre was mentioning, uh, we think that investment in peace building is actually a sovereignty enhancing mechanism. What is worse than a <laughs> what, what worse violation of sovereignty is it when you have uh, 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 12 nationalities uh, soldiering your towns and your cities? Uh, the, the, the conversation with authorities about national ownership, about the way we uh, design uh, our projects to, to ensure that this sovereignty is respected, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. And second, integrating into our projects the building of institutions. So it's not only mm -hmm. about providing support, but about what kind of institutions, about human rights, about rule of law, 
how much of that is integrated into our projects for the medium and long term. So these are the three ways we believe we can be catalytic and raise that very small pie, that very small amount of resources that is actually available for peace building. Thank you very much. Uh, I should be clear that it, we're, we're not only asking you how, how you can raise more money for the <laughs> PBF. We know that it's also our <laughs> task. We, uh, so we're, we're involved in that discussion, of course. You're doing uh, well. Yeah, we, we did. We yeah. doubled our contribution last week. So. Uh, we'll, we'll start off with questions from, from panelists to each other, but also from the audience. But I, and I see a hand already. I see many hands already. I'll, ooh, I see too many hands. This will be tough. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll fill the sort of double role of, of moderating, but also running around with the microphone, because I think it's the only one we have. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll use the privilege of now holding on to it <laughs> uh, to, to, to begin <coughs> by asking uh, in, in this um, atmosphere of frankness and openness. I mean, this is a discussion, I think, on, on racing uh raising financing including private finance mm. uh for conflict affected areas that has been going on it's not new it's it's it uh, temperature is rising i think it's it's uh we're hopefully getting better and uh, there's more attention given to this uh we see it very strongly uh, in both the bank and the, and the un and i think we feel it at home as well mm. but it's still it's not a new question it's it has been around for some time so my first question would be what are you seeing on the ground? Uh, are, are, are changes taking place, or, or this is this a debate that is limited to, uh, to rooms such mm -hmm. as this, or are you seeing actual things happening on the ground? And I would, would uh, take the <laughs> opportunity then to, to ask our ministers from, from, from in-country, from with the real knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's a difficult question because, in a sense, I think uh, j conf uh, con um, confection in a s uh, that I'm hearing the concern from the international community, the struggle you have to raise funds mm -hmm. for issues like peace development, mm -hmm. and then because we're not on that side as 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 the government and the recipient of those funds, we're at the side where uh, we see the funding arrive and then we think about how to effectively use it. So I think I'm going to leave the part how challenging it is to you guys mm. because you're the expert and you have all the analysis. But from our side, I think um, at least in the experience of Afghanistan, uh, and I said this earlier in the morning as well, that we have started to realize that uh, humanitarian support plus peace development support will not be always there for Afghanistan forever. And we have tried to uh, be very frank and honest to our own civilians in Afghanistan as well. And we don't want it to be there forever because, um, I said earlier this morning too, when there is an expectation that the funding will be there unlimited time, then individual starts to feel, uh, no don't feel responsible towards their a long-term sustainability of the government and the institutions and the country as well. So that exercise itself, starting to realize we should not think long-term about the, the, the uh, funding being available, it helped us in a sense the government to s uh, start ref uh, reflecting and finding ways on how to be um, uh, self-reliant and there for Afghanistan as a country which we are going through a lot of challenges and keeping in mind when we're talking as I said this morning about conflict there is post conflict and there is an active conflict mm -hmm. and for a for a state that is struggling uh, with an active uh, conflict on or mm, let's say insecurity issue uh, parallel thinking about development agenda it's really difficult to channel the resources from one to another. So it's, it's, it's not even the prevention of conflict, it's the stopping mm -hmm. conflict, mm -hmm. then going hopefully in the next uh, level, preventing the conflict to happen. Uh, so for us, uh, what we have started to do, uh, going uh, on, the, on, the, on the development side of it, on the economic side in a sense, what we need to do in the long run, we have started to focus for the first time on, on specific areas. One, uh, 
acknowledging we have security issues, then let's find out ways on how do we address security with development. We have started to find out that there is a direct link between development and insecurity. So in areas where we have least developed uh, provinces, there is a high risk of, uh, there is a high probability of uh, insecurity. So there is, there is a link of unemployment, a lack of resources, uh, as well as external factors, plus uh, the insecurity issues too. So we have uh, focused uh, on uh, regional integration as a uh, regional connectivity being one of our uh, compa uh, comparative advantage in the region because uh, we have always been called as a landlocked country where we have no access to the outside world and then as, as any developed uh, um, 21st century uh, citizen we have started to think about uh, uh, diversification of our, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, economic resources in the in the within the country. So the first thing comes up is the trade uh, uh, trade diversification because we have started to realize politically that if we are heavily dependent on one country towards our trade relationship, it has been always taken as a hostile. So we have uh, started to focus on uh, trade diversification and trade diversification helped us to think about regional connectivity and the regional connectivity today has become one of our comparative advantage within the region, trying to help the Central Asian country who have high supply of energy towards the South Asia where there is a high demand for energy and, and we are focused on uh, railroads um, as well as uh, trade agreements uh, between uh, Central Asian countries and, and South Asia and our access to uh, Central Asia plus Europe. So we have uh, expanded our bilateral relationship within Central Asia very effectively to help us. And then a good example is uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, another area is um, private sector development. I think uh, that's really, really key. We have uh, started to find out ways on how to provide uh, enough resources and actually facilities for our private sector. What, what I really mean is that security, usually we do link security to investment uh, being a direct factor uh, in a sense that a lot of in private sector will not invest in an insecure country. But when um, the, the, the actual fact is that private sector is very capable of, <laughs> of actually addressing the security issue versus the unpredictability of um, rules and regulation within the government. So knowing that, we started to work around our own institution and identifying ways on how to help uh, create predictability for uh, private, uh, for in, uh, foreign investors and plus providing uh, the, the platform for them in order to, um, to invest easily in Afghanistan. Uh, the, uh, with, with that also we, we started to find ways on how to increase our export. We are one of the countries with having the highest volume of import and we have a limited volume of uh, export. And of course uh, connectivity is a big barrier. So we worked on creating uh, air corridors uh, with, uh, with countries in the region in order to help our exports find markets in, uh, in the region and beyond. And, and actually um, one request we will have beyond 224 to our international community is to actually open up your markets to our goods because mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. we wanted to see sustainable mm -hmm. growth and development, mm -hmm. we need to help private sector and for private mm -hmm. sector, they need to have access mm -hmm. to uh, the market. And um, uh, agriculture sector, I think that's another area we try to focus so hard and finding ways on how to make sure at least we are consuming our own uh, products. Uh, so one of the vehicles or the one of the uh, resources the government has to utilize is our uh, tremendous pr uh, procurement contract. Uh, we have a heavy security industry and uh, we purchase a lot of it from outside and we're trying to find ways on how to domestically purchase that within the country. Uh, for instance, the, the, the recent one, a good example is the, the rice uh, production. Uh, we were importing rice for our security institution and we started to find ways on how to buy domestically produced rice and we did uh, with the procurement contract giving to domestic producers and uh, we realized there is a push right away uh, to, to produce more. So I think uh, for uh, 
uh, in the example of Afghanistan, we were, were thinking uh, in a sense how dom uh, domestically find resources in order to address our development and peace building uh, challenges. And, uh, and it's not easy, it is difficult as I said because we're in active security, uh, insecurity is a bigger challenge that we're figuring and putting all the resources around our security institution, but at the same time we have tried to keep a balance in between. And, uh, and that's, that's where I see hope for the future. Thank you very much. Minister, do you want to come in? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your deliberation. I just want to comment uh, relation to Somalia practice at the moment, what is, uh, is there. Uh, I think uh, private sector uh, is really important. Uh, as you are aware that um, during civil war uh, and uh, famine and problem, uh, private sector took part for assisting too many people, uh, especially uh, money transfer uh, agencies mm -hmm. who were based in different uh, uh, countries were supporting uh, people. Um, uh, the other thing I want to point out, uh, Somalia, I think there are too many potential for uh, uh, investment and uh, resources. Um, as uh, you may be aware that uh, Somalia is the, has got the largest cost uh, fishery can be a uh, very lucrative mm -hmm. uh, business. Somalia also uh, may have oil gas, which uh, may need a uh, huge investment. Agriculture is, is another one. I think um, uh, really uh, if uh, livestock, if these uh, elements are utilized, I think Somalia can become mm. one of the uh, richest country, but what we need is uh, is 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 um, is uh, stabilization uh, and, and 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 security. Uh, private investment again needs uh, uh, some kind of uh, guarantee mm. uh, in terms of uh, local legislation and local laws, and also they need effective, uh, accountable judiciary. Mm -hmm so that anyone who invests has uh, a guarantee uh, or insurance uh, in order to protect their, their, their business mm -hmm. and wealth. Um, generally, uh, uh, I think as a government, we have uh, a national development plan, which is uh, actually explains what, uh, as a government, we need. And uh, investment is a key for 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 stabilization and uh, peace building as well people will get uh, employment mm -hmm. and more people engage uh, politics and also uh, businesses so i think the more we invest mm -hmm. in in in, in uh, fragile countries uh, the more people will 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 leave mm -hmm. violence and and come to state building thank you very much I'll get on my feet and, and go out into the audience. And I, uh, a year ago, or so I was involved in in, in our in, in the UN conference of on oceans, and we mm. did a lot of work on that. And one conclusion we had afterwards that maybe we should do a, a sort of a, a conference on conferences because mm. we always seem to run out of time and it's challenging. So so that We're might be true them. today as well. So I'll I'll take three questions. I I know who is first. You've been very clear. Uh, uh, and sort of collect those, and uh, and then we'll go from there. I've also learned now that you're supposed to hold the microphone to your chin, so then everyone can hear. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Shinwari, and I'm the CEO of the Institute for Effective Governance here in Stockholm. My question is uh, threefold, actually. Number one, um, <laughs> what is the prospect uh, for actually investing in conflict prevention when uh, you know countries um, in Europe um, that are you know like where the nationalists and populists are on the rise so that we definitely see 
um, cuts okay. in funding and in, in international aid to countries <laughs> that are affected by conflict and insecurity. <coughs> um, number two, um, we know there are at least five conflicts that are more regional than international, and that include Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Ukraine in those countries. So what will be how this um, international aid can be spent effectively uh, to forge regional cooperation to prevent conflict. Because when you invest, you need to have a return on investment. And when there is a geopolitical struggle, the power struggle within those countries, how we can ensure that we can have a good return on that. Third, <coughs> um, Minister paint a very rosy picture about Afghanistan. I'm from Afghanistan. <laughs> um, I think Afghanistan has really progressed over the last few years. But it's a country that is still highly divided. Um, it's a country where corruption is on the top. Um, and it's a country where the rule of law is the weakest. Um, what, 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 what are your plans to sustain the developments that have been uh, gained by the taxpayers of the international mm -hmm. community? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it's three questions in one. So, so it'll be a challenge, but uh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, Mori Akremi, one of uh, women human rights activists from Afghanistan. And I could say also one of the peace builders working on peace building since 2004. But one thing was missing. My colleagues has just raised the issue that it was not like the priority of the international community like to, to focus on the peace building. Mm -hmm. uh, we have experience of working at community and how to, to bring peace and how to, to educate and advocate peace within the community, because usually in Afghanistan, everything comes from the top. And the ignorance of the community, and, and particularly the ignorance of the women's participation in peace process, it's, it's something like it's a must to be. Uh, I really appreciate such a forums, because I remember 2006, I was in such a forums, and we raised the same issue. And now we are here, and we still have the same issue, like uh, how to do uh, invest on peace and how to, to develop peace and uh, bring peace in a such a country like Afghanistan. My humble request from all international community and particularly from the panelists, like from the organizer of such a forums, unless we should give hands and unless we should come together to give priority and to consider those countries which are still under conflict, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like Syria, then we should uh, start the development on building peace and unity among those countries. And uh, I just uh, hear from all, and particularly from our uh, uh, deputy ministers, what she has raised everything, but one thing which is uh, still missing in Afghanistan, the role of women mm -hmm. in peace process, mm -hmm. and which is really a must. Afghanistan has historically, women has played a great role in mm -hmm. peace building. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, yes, the political will is uh, still there. We appreciate the government wants to the woman be part mm -hmm. of, but unfortunately, when we come to the community level, mm -hmm. we still have the problems. I could say, share one of the experience of being member of IP's council in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. sitting with those people that they have killed during the last 40 years, thousands of people of Afghanistan, sitting with them in one table, but uh, still we have those challenges. But my humble request for, for, uh, from all international community, when we focus on Afghanistan, please do not forget the role of women and women's mm. inclusion mm. in peace process. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I've seen your hands very clearly. I have to ask you first, are you from Afghanistan? No, good. <laughs> good, good. We need some diversity there. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to complain that there were two questions. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm Lin from Myanmar. Uh, I'm ah. a medical doctor as well as a health economist, so if please excuse if my question sounds crazy. Uh, the world is now becoming more multipolar, mm. and like for them, like uh, countries, Asian countries, like getting richer, like Japan, South South Korea, China, where they have like a lot of political as well as economic influence, and they do engage in a lot of like developmental activities, not only in Asia but also like Latin America or like Africa, and they do have like uh, like some points of potential regional conflict, like the South China Sea or like uh, like North Korea or these things. So. My question is very general. So, uh, when I had hear about like peace building and like the like sources of funding and like how we tackle, I maybe it's just my opinion is like more Western nice approach or like like the procedures and the like the sources of uh, funding or mostly maybe mostly coming from like uh, Europe or like uh, United uh, United States. 
But my question is like, how do you think like strategically this involving like emerging multipolar uh, regional as well as like mm -hmm. global powers? Are you engaging them in terms of like uh, peace development or like how do you like <coughs> are you getting like alternate additional sources of funding for peace from these countries or like what is your general take on this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think it's a, a crazy question at all. <laughs> uh, uh, challenging, perhaps, but not, but not uh, wrong. I know there are many more questions, and, and we also have only five minutes. So, so my, my the, the good thing is that, as, as you were saying, Minister, you have more panels. So we'll, we'll, we'll follow you around <laughs> uh, with a lot of different questions. You can answer all those. But I... Um, if I if I divide the time, it's it's uh, it's I a minute or two per person. If you want to 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 respond, uh, so I don't uh, because the questions are are I think asked to all of us. Uh, so if I may, may I start with you, Karen? Yes. Yes. You may. I'll try to be brief, uh, and I'll try to focus on the first question actually on on how to support effective governance when populism is on the rise. Prevention and and building effective governance is something which takes time. Uh, it, it needs uh, ODA, but also private investments over decades, uh, most probably. It, it requires brave politicians, but brave politicians requires functioning administrations, uh, which provides them with good works and good information that they can work with. So I think you actually pinpointed one of the most uh, challenging tasks for all of us at this stage of history to find good financing for prevention, preventive work, but also for long-term ter development cooperation uh, at this time when more and more uh, countries are inward looking. It was uh, touched upon at the panel in the morning, uh, but I think that we have to, to, to continue to talk about that in different ways. At CEDA, we are trying to work uh, to see the world as a whole. I think that the Somali minister said the world is becoming a small village in this morning's panel, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, very true, which means that we are trying to one way of um, upholding high levels of ODA is, of course, to, to tell about the positive developments. And one positive, de this links me to my second comment, one positive development as a result of our uh, prevention or long-term developments is a blurry line, is of course our work in Afghanistan. We support the Swedish Afghanistan Committee uh, and their work on getting girls into school, women out into the labor market, and women out into the political sector. So that is my second answer. How do we, do we support women in Afghanistan? Yes, we do. No answers. For but certainly two reactions. Uh, yes. I mean, first, what's going on on the ground, and I want to drill a bit on this point, there is a huge gap between, let's say, the Colombia of this world mm -hmm. and the uh, African Republic of this world. Money is actually flowing to the countries that have the most capacities where <laughs> uh, the government is the strongest. Um, you know, in Colombia, uh, they've mobilized almost $100 million now for this building. In CAR, we had a conference a year and a half ago uh, on the recovery and peace building assessment, apart from a s uh, amount of money from the World Bank and the UN and the Peace Building Fund, no money has come to CAR. Uh, so I, I do think that on the ground, we need to find ways for money to flow in those countries that have the least capacities, have the incentives that Alexandre was mentioning for the money to be able to flow to this, diversify the partnerships, um, and, and at the Peace Building Fund, for example. Uh, we know that I, you know, UN capacities in these countries are limited, mm -hmm. and we're turning towards civil society organizations, private sector, regional uh, actors to be able to spend those, those funds. And I think this is uh, really important. I'm really happy that you've mentioned uh, the issue of role of women, and, and especially at the local level. Uh, at least at the Peace Building Fund, this has been a struggle. In 2014, less than 5% of our funding was going directly to women empowerment and peace building. In 2017, 36% is going to women empowerment and peace building. And we've been able to do this by 
changing the kind of ad accompaniment we did uh, for local partners by building capacities of our own staff to understand those issues and engage by changing the ways we do budgets. Uh, but this has been a, a real struggle and we do hope to continue raising that. But uh, that is only possible with explicit strategies changing the way we, we function uh, internally. Sure. Um, I would be trying to be fast. I think three questions, there are three points on, in regards to uh, me and regarding the divided society. Oh, we have to move out? What do no, you no, 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 no. Okay. We are contributing to the division of, uh, you know, some start with lunch at 1 o'clock. We are now in the one thirty group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think uh, Afghanistan is a, it's a, it's a new democracy. So I think if you're referring to the political division, um, gave us time. Let, let democracy uh, create roots within the society and within the institution and people have the freedom to express their, their, uh, their political uh, uh, opposition and, 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 and views. And in terms of uh, the, the traditional division or the, the division that had been created in the last 30 years, it's deep, but uh, it's our responsibility to work around uh, peace building process, reconciliation, it starts to help it out. In terms of corruption, I have never said that Afghanistan is not on one of the corrupt mm -hmm. countries list. Mm -hmm. it, is, it definitely is uh, a, a major, major challenge, mm -hmm. not only for our international partners, but for government itself. Um, I raised uh, the first point why it, was it had became such a severe issue. And my second uh, response is that the government, for the first time, has started to take uh, um, measures, meaning there is a political commitment, and of course uh, there are uh, um, citizens' uh, responsibility yeah. towards addressing that challenge as well. Um, in terms of, okay, in terms of uh, sustainable development, I think uh, we. Uh, I've been keep saying that uh, we have uh, a proper vision, a roadmap uh, that we have uh, before us. But one part that is needed from the government is also to stick to that, and the also from the international community to invest in a uh, long-term sustainable uh, project because usually the donor community or uh, humanitarian work is that it's so much driven towards uh, quick results and quick results in long-term sustainable uh, growth doesn't happen. We have to be patient. In terms of a role of women in peace building, I have, there is a third panel I'm going to be talking again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer that question to the third panel, but I couldn't agree more than with uh, my colleague that yes, a woman are an important part and driver of uh, peace building uh, within household, within the society, and within the structure or with the High Peace Council as well. But what we have to push right now is that women being <coughs> at the High Peace Council, but they should have the voice of being able to make the decisions. Uh, there was the last one was on engaging, the con uh, engaging countries on the peace uh, dialogue or uh, platform. Uh, you had raised it. In our example, in our uh, experience, we have done it, but the only we have uh, cleared the uh, roles and responsibilities. We have said we welcome any platform where, and that platform means being led by any country that helps to raise and support the consensus for peace and peace agenda in Afghanistan. But when it comes to direct talk with insurgents and with the Taliban, I think the experience have shown that it should the government itself should be involved and the Afghans themselves. So that's, that's uh, where I'm going to end. Thank you very much. I I'll now stand up to, to, to push the time a little bit. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, I hear people are entering the room. So, uh, yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll give you half a minute. Yeah, I'll be very, very fast. I think this issue about public opinion and peace building, we are all sitting here sharing the same idea. There are many people outside who just don't share our views, uh, both in developing countries, in development countries, in others. That's a very important target. So I'll just say, in our PIF pathway for peace, we realized that we took some successful case. We took Indonesia. The, the prime minister who did the most on peace building lost the election. We know that the referendum was lost in uh, in Colombia uh, on the peace agreement and we see that again and again you know uh, in Europe the most uh, sustainable peace process was contested and is contested uh, all the time the, the 
the, the contribution of Europe to peace is con contested all the time. So th this is really important, the narrative we can have for outside. Mm -hmm. It's more urgent mm -hmm. now than ever, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think I just want to point out very quickly, uh, we talk about women participation in this building, but what we need also to talk, women participation in the security sector and in justice mm. sector. Mm. It's really important. Sometimes mm. Uh, mm. if they are not there, they cannot uh, mention their problem exactly. So we need to concentrate that as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We've learned and we have uh, raised, I think, more questions. We'll follow you around in the panels to come. And we have uh, two more days or two and a half more days to continue this very important discussion here in Stockholm. <laughs> and as was mentioned this morning, it's also a conversation that's really taking place in a lot of uh, places. So a good chance uh, to follow that. Thank you very much and thank you.